the ninth commandment. What does it mean? Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. We're going to discuss it right after this. Hi, I'm Jim Staley, Passion for Truth Ministries, and we've been walking through the Ten Commandments and discussing the real meaning behind each and every one of them, diving into the culture, the context, the language, and allowing the Holy Spirit to bring greater revelation than ever before. And today, I believe, will be no different. In the Ninth Commandment, it says this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. It says, very simply, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does that mean? That's exactly what we're going to be discussing today is we're going to find out what does it mean to bear false witness? What does it mean to lie? As most parents will say, where thou shall not lie. Is that what it really means? Let's dive into the word truth because the opposite of a lie is truth. And in Hebrew, the word truth is emet and it's spelled aleph mem tav. Now, this is really interesting because in the paleo Hebrew, the aleph is the very first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it is a more of like a strength of an ox. It's the leader. It's the strength or the leader. Mem happens to be dead center, the middle of the alphabet, of the Hebrew alphabet, and it is really kind of the waters of chaos that produces something, like, the, like, the, like Noah's flood or, or the, the rupturing of a water when a baby is born. And then The Tav is the very last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it simply means covenant. So put all three together, and first of all, you have this amazing picture. God's trying to tell us something that from the beginning to the middle to the very end, that is truth. All of the letters of the alphabet, of the Hebrew alphabet, are creative. All of it together is truth. I believe it also kind of tells us that from the very beginning and the middle and at the end of our life, in every circumstance, we need to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I love the way that we, this is put together in the Paleo Hebrew because we've got the strength of the leader in the waters of chaos, life can get chaotic, brings forth covenant. In other words, leadership is born out of chaos when we walk in the truth. And that produces covenant. That is the real meaning of the word truth that we're supposed to walk in. And I want to talk about truth for just a little bit longer because as as a as a minister and a Bible teacher that does a lot of counseling and and healing with people, one of the biggest things that we that I've discovered in my own personal life, along with the lives of hundreds of others, is that truth is something that we don't walk in on a subconscious level. What do I mean by that? is a lot of people, most of the problems that we have is because the enemy planted a lie on the inside of us. When he plants a lie on the inside of us, he knows that God created us to do what we believe. So if we believe a lie about someone, or even about yourself, or even about God, our lives will absolutely exemplify that. We will walk out what we believe, whether we even consciously know it or not. And so when we discover someone that has a lie built inside of them, for instance, they they believe that they're not worthy. Well, then everything they do is going to revolve around that lie. And so we go back in time to that that trauma, to that moment, and we reverse that lie, set them free, and speak the truth. Because the truth only knows how to do one thing, right? Set people free. So the ninth commandment is critical because there's so many people that have a born false witness against us. And you can do this, a, a father can do this. And a, and a five-year-old little girl by telling her that, that she's ugly or she's not pretty or she's not smart. And that's bearing false witness because that is not what the God of heaven says about each and every one of us. We are beautiful, we are valued, we are appreciated, and we have all purpose built into his kingdom. We're just waiting to discover what that purpose is. But the enemy's there to steal, kill, and destroy that purpose. And maybe you're one of those out there that the enemy has implanted a lie, and you didn't even know that it was connected to the ninth commandment of thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. But this is how you became broken, is someone gave a false testimony about you. They implanted a lie into your heart. And so I hope by the end of this short teaching, uh, God will reveal to you what those lies are, and you can begin to reveal uh, uh, through your mouth, through the spoken word, to the devar, 
uh, can, when the Bible says confess your sins to one another, right? Confess that Jesus, Yeshua is Lord. That is what causes resurrection. It's the confession of the truth. There's no other way that by a man can be ever saved than to confess the truth. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go through 10 examples in the Bible. There's hundreds, but really I'm going to give you 10 of some of my favorite examples of how bearing false witness and lying can bring utter and chaotic destruction. And I don't think there's a better example to start off with in the very beginning of the book of Genesis with Satan himself. Listen, and I want you to see if you can pick out all of the similarities between each one of these examples. First of all, Satan was rejected by God because of his actions and out of that fear and jealousy. Now look, he's sent to earth and all of a sudden God decides to make man in his image and then gives man the authority over the earth while he's crawling around uh, right on all fours. His wings are clipped and, uh, and, and he has no authority. He wants that ring of power. He's jealous of the authority that God gave man. And so he chooses to bear false witness against God by telling man God didn't really mean what he said. You're not really going to die. And he's been using that same trick over and over. God didn't really mean what he said. God doesn't really want you to honor your parents. God doesn't really think it's a big deal if you serve other gods. It's not a big deal. You don't really have to keep the Sabbath. Like every time we turn around, he's using the same false witness. So Satan is the number one example in the garden of bearing false witness and the catastrophe that enveloped the utter destruction of mankind enveloped across the nations and across the continents because of one false witness, one lie. That is the risk that we all take when we bear false witness. It, the ripple effect can last for eternity. People can give up their salvation. They can not ever become saved to begin with. They want nothing to do with God because of the witness that you are. You see, it's not necessarily just about what you say. It, it, it's, it's who you are. What is the witness that you have? You know, we, we hear, uh, you know, in, 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 even in worship circles, you know, can I get a witness, right, from a, from a church service? Can I get a witness? What is the witness? Someone that says that is the truth. That's Emmett. That is the leadership of chaos that brings covenant. I agree with that. But does your life bear witness to what your tongue is saying. That's what we're going to discuss. So number one, Satan in the garden is a great example of, of a deceiver and someone that bears false witness and, and the consequences that came from that. Number two, Absalom. Absalom. Who was Absalom? Absalom was David's son, King David's son. And Absalom was angry and extraordinarily upset because his brother, uh, uh, his brother had, his half brother, excuse me, had raped his sister Tamar. And so he went and killed his half-brother, and he got banished from the kingdom. So he was rejected by King David. And then on top of that, when he was allowed to come back years later, he was jealous of King David, his father. And, that, and, and he was angry that David did not give him a greater position. And four years later, he began to speak in the ears of every leader and everybody that was around King David. He was a good-looking man. He was a, 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 a talented man. He was a great oratory a leader, and, and he just spoke the itching ears, what they wanted to hear. And he got most of the people on their side. Hey, if I was, if I was uh, in charge, this is what I would do. Uh, if I was the king, you would be this leader. And he began to create dissension just a little bit here, a little bit there. Have you ever met anyone like that? That speaks ill of leadership just in the smallest way. Oh, if pastor, uh, so-and-so wasn't like this, or I feel like he was a little too harsh with this person, and, and but I'm here for you. I, I, I'm here to hear you out. That's a spirit of Jezebel who loves to take down leadership and push leadership down to raise themselves up. And that spirit of Jezebel, which has nothing to do with male or female, uh, it, it is inside of Absalom. Absalom was operating in that controlling spirit that wanted to elevate himself. He was, it always operates out of jealousy. 
greed and fear of losing something. Have you ever met a bully on the playground? Ultimately, the bully is, is, is sometimes jealous of someone else, but most of the time they are afraid of losing something. And what are they afraid of losing? Most of the time their authority, their power, their gifting, their, their influence, and they push other people down to maintain that. And so Absalom is a great uh, way, a great example of what deception and bearing false witness does. What it eventually did was Absalom took over the throne. He was successful in removing the leadership that God had ordained, and he did it through slander. See, he didn't just do it uh, through, through an army. He did it by speaking evil and bearing false witness against David and his emotives, his agenda, and the people bought it hook, line, and sinker. Have you ever had that happen in your life where someone slanders you, they make a false allegation against you, and many times you don't even know it till it's too late, and then they have a whole posse uh, in a coup built around you, and then you get displaced? If you've been in ministry for any length of time, you have had that Jezebel Absalom spirit in your congregation. I know I've had it in my own uh, former congregation, and that's exactly what caused a church split, is that lower level leadership or people begin to speak, they bear false witness, they give up, uh, uh, the enemy creates a posse, creates a coup, and all of a sudden, the one that's ordained by God is the bad guy, and Absalom becomes the good guy. The great news is, is that time always tells where Absalom, who's Absalom and who is David. And so let's move on to number three. Number three, Potiphar's wife. This is a great example of breaking the ninth commandment. Potiphar uh, was a military commander in Egypt at the time. Joseph was brought into Potiphar's house. He became number one, tremendous amount of favor with Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife was jealous and she was attracted to him. So she came up to him one day and, and accused him. Uh, well, she wanted to lie with him. Joseph said no. Uh, praise God for integrity, right? Uh, and he said no. She got angry because of the rejection. And she was jealous of Joseph and his favor. So she chose to what? Accuse him falsely. And falsely accusing someone can end them up in prison. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph. I know that feeling all too well of being falsely accused and put in places and situations that I shouldn't be in just because of jealousy, greed, and false expectations and false allegations. We've all been there. Nobody is, 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 can go through life and not be falsely accused. It's a horrible feeling. But in the case of Joseph, it ended him up in prison. The great news is, is when you are truly falsely accused, God will restore uh, what the locusts have eaten twice to 10 times over. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph. God put him in second in command when he came out of prison and he impacted millions of people around the world. So that's Genesis chapter 39 if you want to look it up. Let's move on to number four, Joseph's brothers also falsely accused Joseph. And where did it come from? Rejection from their father because they were jealous of the favor. They were jealous that the favor that, that Jacob gave Joseph was far more than the rest of his brothers, and that set the stage for bitterness and anger and resentment to, 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 to seed inside of their hearts, and they waited like a lion in the grass for the right opportunity to pounce, and they did. They found him alone, they falsely accused him, they threw him in the pit, and then sold him out from underneath him, and then came back and lied to their father Jacob broke his heart, almost killed him in grief, and years went by, decade and a half to be exact, over about 17 years, I think, if I remember properly. And then Jacob came in and finally was restored. God doesn't look down lightly on breaking the ninth commandment. So that's number four, Joseph's brothers. See the pattern that we're developing here. Out of a spirit of fear, Aaron was... Uh, the one that had this great and grand idea of worshiping God through a golden calf. Everybody get off their gold earrings and, and necklaces, and they molded this golden calf, 
And remember, Moses came down to ask Aaron about it, and Aaron's like, I don't know what happened. I, I, we had the, all this gold, and out came a golden calf. And he, he said the people are the ones that did it. But the text actually says he is leading the entire posse and says, hey, tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. And so the Israelites thought they were going to feast unto Yahweh. And from their perspective, they weren't worshiping another god. They lost the mediator. That's what they were used to. They can't worship the gods uh, without a mediator. They lost Moses. So they're going to worship God through a golden calf because that's what they were used to doing in Egypt. Aaron was all for it. Then he realized, oh, shoot, this probably was a bad idea. And he shifted blame. Why? Because of fear. That's another reason why people break the ninth commandment so easily and they can lie is out of fear. Ask any child when they get caught and getting trouble, they will immediately, in many cases, they will tell a white lie to get off of the hot seat. They're afraid. The spirit of fear moves people to break the ninth commandment. And Aaron himself at the top of the food chain the high priest was no different. Number 16, this is one of my favorite ones, a great example of breaking the ninth commandment, bearing false witness, is Korah in number 16. He's so upset that things aren't going his way and that Moses had all this favor with God and given all this attention that one of the leaders of Israel decided, you know what, Moses, you take too much on yourself. Why are you always, it's always about you, Moses. It's always about what you say. You're always telling us what to do. And Korah was able to do exactly what Absalom would do later. He would begin to get into the ears of all of the leaders and say, why does Moses act like this? Who does he think that he is telling us what to do and look at us out there? And all of the negative talk that Korah did he was allowed uh, to manipulate and orchestrate 250 of the top leaders of Israel to go against Moses. It didn't end up very well for him because Moses was like, look, his, by the way, this next statement is why God chose Moses. Moses didn't defend himself. He didn't say, I'm the king. I'm the leader. I'm the anointed one. Look at my staff. He never said any of that. He could have easily said, hey, by the way, which one of you opened up the Red Sea by raising their hand? Do I see that hand? No, I don't. Okay. He could have done all kinds of things. He could have said, you know, I was the one on Mount Sinai. I heard the voice of God. God let me come up there. I brought the Ten Commandments written in stone. Anybody remember that? Uh, He could have humiliated them, but he chose not to. He entertained their thought and he said, you know, I don't know if I really want this job anyway. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. And maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't be leader. Let's let God choose. And then ironically, he goes to God and and then comes back and says, guys, here's what we're going to do. And they all do exactly what he says. (laughs) The very thing that they're accusing him of doing, which is telling them what to do. They do what he says to do, which is everybody go get a staff, go get a censor. And we're going to find out which one buds. And we're going to find out of what God says. And what God said was fire comes down from heaven. And so Korah died. All the 250 leaders of Israel that were on his side became crispy critters. And Moses won the day and kept the favor of God. So there's something to be learned here. Number one, again, greed, jealousy, rejection. They felt like they, they, they wanted more than what God had given them in their station of life. They wanted what someone else had. And, and one thing to learn here, it, although we see utter destruction and death and judgment on anyone that would pull their tongue out of their mouth and put it against uh, a leader of Israel or those that are anointed or those that are in leadership or anyone else, especially those in, in leadership, the Bible says, do not raise a hand against those in leadership. That's my job. If they're out of line, I will make sure that they know about it. And we leave our leadership over to God because that's how God works in his hierarchy. He's really good at disciplining those who he loves. And those who uh, purport to be teachers are judged far more strictly. we got to be careful everything that we say and do will be held against us in the court of God. But another thing to be learned by this is that if you ever get slandered, if you ever have false allegations landed on you, what do you do? Do what Moses did. Hit the deck. Pray for them and be okay with with the allegations. It hurts. Yes, it's not fair, but God always redeems those that are falsely accused. Always. He will come to your rescue 
if you don't rescue yourself. We don't need to defend ourselves. I've been falsely accused beyond imagination in my life, probably more than most will ever in 10 lifetimes. And God just keeps encouraging me as much as I want to defend myself. Just be a light, God says. Just don't defend yourself. The people will eventually see the truth about your life by the fruit of your tree. Just judge people by the fruit. And when the fruit doesn't look so great, pray for the tree so that it produces better fruit. We all want better fruit. Uh, we shouldn't be fruit inspectors to start throwing fruit at each other. Uh, that makes a, a, a not a good kingdom of God. That is, that's real children of God, is when we start throwing tantrums and throwing things at each other because we don't like this person says, we don't like this person, look what that person's doing. We spend more time criticizing others than we do actually cultivating the roots uh, of our trees and those that are around us so that we can all grow up in the kingdom of God. Amen. All right, let's move forward. Number seven, in Joshua 9, the Gibeonites were so afraid of Israel, uh, and they were a neighboring uh, city that was coming. They were a territory that Israel was coming upon, and they knew it. Israel's killing everybody and destroying everything uh, as they're moving across the, the land of Canaan, taking back what's rightfully theirs. The Gibeonites saw this, and they created a brilliant plan out of fear they sent some ambassadors. They act like they'd gone from a long, come from a long distance. They had worn out sandals and fake stale bread, and they tricked Joshua and the leadership into creating a covenant with them and joined them and were fine with being slaves and servants in Israel. And then, they, and then of course, Israel and Joshua found out, holy cow, these people are right over the hill. They're not from countries far away. They're right over the hill. And, uh, and they weren't allowed uh, to destroy or to attack the Gibeonites because they just made a covenant with them. And so we see here an interesting twist, not a typical Absalom, Korah, flat out allegations, you know, false witness. But what we do see is we see that out of fear of losing something, the Gibeonites decided to lie, deceive a leadership to gain favor of what they wanted so that they can get what they wanted. And so we see this over and over and over again. People are willing to bend the truth and lie to get what they want. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. Every one of us have stretched the truth a little beyond what it should be. Go try to buy a used car and you'll find out that they will stretch a lot of times that truth to what, the, what you want it to be just to make the sale. Not everybody's like that, but we've all been there, done that. I've been in sales my whole entire life before I was in ministry, and, uh, and I have done that. I think everybody that believes in their product tells you what you want to hear, the best parts of that product, and tends to minimize the negative parts of that product. And so we want to make sure that when, when we are uh, we, we do not walk in fear and we tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. All right. So that's number seven. Let's move on to number eight. First Samuel chapter 15. Saul was told by Samuel, by God to destroy the Amalekites for what they did when Israel came out of Egypt. Every one of them were supposed to be destroyed. Every single one, including the king and all of their cattle, they were to be wiped off the face of the planet. You know why? Because God saw over time, outside of time, he could see what would happen if they didn't. These were evil, evil, evil people. And God saw six million Jews being killed by an Agagite, uh, by Hitler, that comes all the way from the line of the Amalekites. And so here's what he said. He said, look, get rid of all of them. Destroy them from the face of the, the earth. I loathe their presence like Sodom and Gomorrah. They are so evil. And, and uh, what happened? Saul got greedy. He chose to keep the best of the cattle, the best of the sheep, said, oh, and Samuel checked him on it and said, hey, why do I hear sheep bleeding in my ears, right? Uh, Saul's like, oh, well, we got the best of the sheep because we want to sacrifice for the Lord God. Yeah, right. You got the best of the sheep because you're going to sacrifice one and keep nine uh, for your own herdsmen and pay your, your army uh, with cattle. That's what you did. And he kept the king all right, Agag, he kept the king, and, uh, and Samuel himself had to kill uh, uh, Agag, and they didn't kill everybody. He came and falsely testified to Samuel that hey, we destroyed and utterly annihilated everybody. But then you go to 2 Samuel, 
And this whole chapter, the whole book starts off with King David having to fight the very people that Saul said he destroyed. He didn't. And not only that, uh, 400 got away from, from David and it shows up all the way through time. And you know who Haman was in the book of Esther that wanted to kill all of the Jews, including Queen Esther? He was Haman the Agagite. He was a descendant of King Agag that did not, that, that his lineage was not annihilated like Saul was supposed to. And God saw all this happening. So we wouldn't even have the problem in the book of Esther if we didn't have, if Saul would have obeyed the voice of God. So you can see how greed, false testimony creates utter destruction for generations. You can't get away from it. Number nine, in Acts chapter five, we see this amazing story of Ananias and Sapphira. Who are they? They are part of the disciples crew. They are going to, they are part of the entire family and community that, that agreed to sell everything they had uh, and give it into and put the money into the, the purse of the community to be given to everyone and spread evenly. They lied to the disciples by saying that we sold everything we had, but they did not give the disciples all of the money. They held back some of it for, them, for themselves. And in doing so, the scriptures say that they lied to the Holy Spirit as well. Now, it would have been better for them to say, hey, uh, we, we sold it all, uh, but we need to keep back, you know, 10 grand for ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Okay, then be honest about it. You changed your mind. But when you say that we're going to do something, like I'm going to tithe before the Lord God, I'm going to give 10% of everything that God gives me, and then you forget, or you spend that on yourself, or, or you do this or do that, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. You're bearing false witness before the very throne of God. We are called to be stewards of everything that we have. Our mind, our will, our emotions, our relationships, our money, our finances, everything. If we are not built to increase the kingdom of heaven, then we are increasing the kingdom of hell. You might say, oh no, Jim, you, you can increase your own kingdom. If you increase your own kingdom to the detriment of the kingdom of heaven, you are increasing the kingdom of hell. You're bearing false witness of the name that you say that you serve. Don't say that you serve Christ, that you're a child of the living God, that you follow Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and certainly do not say that you follow the front of the book and you love the whole Bible and then bear false witness and be critical against your neighbor, pointing out every single fault as if it's your last day on earth and you want to make sure that everybody knows that they need to repent. If you are the Bible police and you're the sin police and you're the Torah police and you're the police of every theology, then you're walking in the sin of Satan. You're walking in the characteristic of the accuser and you, in your every last word is to point to everyone else's inferior position. Then you need to check your heart because the truth is, you probably have jealousy in your heart. You probably have greed in your heart. You're probably afraid of losing something because you were hurt when you were a kid or when you were younger and you were traumatized and, and you didn't feel the value and the appreciation, the purpose. You don't have the proper identity of knowing who you are in Christ. You don't have to push people down to have identity and influence and the fruit of the spirit of joy in your life. You don't need to do that. That's what Satan feels like he needs to do out of anger and, and resentment and envy. Those characteristics ought not to be found in the body of Messiah. Amen. All right. So Ananias and Sapphira, they blew it and it cost them their life. They dropped dead right at the feet of the disciples. You see the pattern here is overwhelming when you have greed, jealousy, rejection, and fear of losing something, it will end in destruction for the one that is passing on that negative false allegation. And by the way, you don't even have to be the one initiating the false allegation. If you promote it, you're walking in that same place of Absalom, Korah, Satan himself. All right. And 10 and by far, this is the best example of in the Bible, next to number one, which started all the problems of, of breaking the commandments, is number 10. What is 10? Best example, false witness, utter destruction is the Pharisees that falsely accused Jesus, Yeshua, 
and then crucified him for it. Why did they do that? Because, again, look at the pattern. They were jealous of his influence. They were jealous. Uh, he had the biggest YouTube channel. He had the most influence on Facebook. He had the, you know, viral videos on Instagram. Yeshua Jesus Christ was the man of the hour, and they knew it. They said, we've got to get a hold of this guy before the whole entire city goes after him. That is a dead giveaway to their jealousy their greed and hunger for power, their fear of rejection of the people. He, remember, he humiliated them in front of others. And they were afraid of losing what they had worked so hard for generations to get, that position and that power and that theological bent. Yeshua stripped it all out of humility and truth. He wasn't he wasn't mean. He wasn't angry, except for the time in the temple where he kind of showed off his righteous anger, and rightfully so. But he just spoke the truth. It set people free, and that ticked them off. He didn't yell at people, be healed, be healed. He just said, be healed, and they were healed. He didn't cast out demons by yelling and screaming at them. He just said, go. He understood the power and the authority. He knew that he didn't have to be passionate and all kinds of crazy stuff, dramatic. He just spoke and the worlds came into existence. And so we see that the ninth commandment, at the end of the day, it revolves around jealousy, greed, fear of losing something, and then lastly, a lack of information. There's really only two main sources of lying and false allegations. There are primary sources, and that's the person that is almost always, the, the person that initiated a, a false allegation will have a bias. They got hurt by the person. Uh, they got, uh, they're jealous of that person. They have greed or uh, at the very, very, very least, they, they, they didn't do their homework and they didn't get all of the information. They never went to the person like the Bible says and verified the information. See, hear the other side, even if they feel like there's no way there can be an answer to this, if they didn't go to the other person and vet that out, they are not allowed to make a judgment. So that's the primary source. And it's almost always skewed. You can think of the mainstream media, okay, that is a primary source of information, primary source of false allegation, and they don't vet out. Uh, and they have a bias on top of that. So you can think government. Our government is getting more corrupt every single day. The governments of the world are run by Satan himself. They are under his puppeteer. So the information that's going to come out from them, they are going to falsely accuse believers left and right. They're going to do this. They're going to try to indict uh, these pre this person over here or that person over here. Governments will say one thing. Politicians are known for the same one thing, falsely accuse uh, their opponent. It's all about negativity because they know that when they create negative, shocking information, that the general public will believe it. They won't vet it out. Okay. Secondary sources. What's a secondary source? A secondary source is the person trusting the primary source. So they have some sort of relationship with that source. So uh, if, if someone watches Fox News, for instance, they have, they trust Fox News with more conservative news, or they trust CNN or MSNBC, uh, with their news. So there's a trusting relationship. A, 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 a child with their parent, an employee with their boss, right? So, uh, a, a, a parishioner with their pastor or their bishop or their priest. If you have a relationship with someone that you trust, when that person, that primary person says something, the parishioner or the person that trusts them, that secondary source, is likely to believe them without ever vetting it out. And I will say this, never trust what I say. Look it up. Look everything up that I'm telling you in the scriptures. Go back and read these and you'll see it for yourself. I've been wrong many times and perhaps I'm wrong again, but I believe the ninth commandment is so serious that it plays itself out over and over and over and over again. And God's trying to get our attention. It's the reason why it made the top 10. And I'm going to show you in a minute. It's not just uh, the ninth commandment alone. Breaking the ninth commandment breaks multiple other commandments. And so primary source, secondary source, 
the bottom line is, is that if you ever hear gossip or slander or a false allegation or some shocking news about anybody, I don't care who it is. If you didn't get a chance to hear the other side, you don't have the right to make a judgment. To do so puts yourself in a very precarious position. And quite frankly, it puts yourself into what in Hebrew is called Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara is what's called the evil tongue. All right. It's reporting private information about someone that's negative, that they wouldn't want to hear if you said it in, in, in private, right? And could be wrong. And when we are wrong, and even if it's true, by the way, when you expose someone that's in sin, now I know there's people out there that have full YouTube channels that their whole purpose is to expose other teachers and expose other leaders in their minutia of the mistakes they make in theology or their, their or maybe that character issue or a sin issue. And somehow the body of Christ, there are members that believe that they hold the position of judge that they're supposed to expose everyone around them. Well, you know what the Bible says about that? There was a gentleman that did that. And, 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 and let me just think of his name. You know, it was a Shem and Ham and it was Ham. Ham was the one where his father was naked and drunk in the, t in the, in the, in the tent, Noah. And it was Shem and Japheth that had the respect. Now picture this, is that Noah is a leader. Let's say he was alive today and he made a mistake. And he got drunk and he, and, and, he, and he had too much wine on Shabbat, whatever it was, and, it, and, and he, he made a mistake. And his two sons covered up the mistake because they said, you know what? This is private. This is my dad. I love him. He made a mistake. We're going to talk to him in the morning and, and try to help him uh, get restored to the rest of the family. Ham decided, no, heck no. We're going live on Facebook right now. Here's dad. Look at him. He's naked. He's drunk. He made a mistake. He's a hypocrite. Don't follow him on, on social media anymore. God condemned and cursed him for exposing someone else's sin. You know why? Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Judge not lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And it goes on to say that why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye while you have an entire forest, a log in your own eye? In other words, there's no one righteous, not even one. If any of us were immediately brought before the throne of God, we would melt into the floor and the street of heaven. You know why? Because we couldn't stand in the presence of God. The fire of God and his righteous indignation against sin would burn everything out of us. Nobody is perfect. All of us have made mistakes. Some of us, big mistakes. Maybe you're like me and you regret major mistakes in your life. You wish you could redo life over with what you know now and what you've learned. Ladies and gentlemen, why is it that religious people are the, are the meanest people on the planet to one another? When God says that we will know them by their love, then that discounts probably 25% of us, of, of us believers because we don't love. We're critical. We're mean. We look at and we nitpick and we say, look at that. He said this wrong. He's got this wrong. He got 98% of this right, but this part is wrong. Therefore, he's a false teacher. Or we're mean to our spouses. We're constantly looking for the negative. Do you ever feel like that? Wives, do you ever feel like your husband's just constantly picking on you and mocking you and making fun of you and not valuing you and criticizing you? Husbands, do you feel the same way? Maybe it's because you are that way to others. Have you ever considered that God's giving you back what maybe you deserve? Some of you don't deserve it, and you're amazing people, but your spouse is critical and has the spirit of, of Jezebel and Absalom and Korah and Ham. What do we do in those situations? We do what Moses did. We get on our knees and we pray for those people and we beg God for mercy and compassion. We don't ask God to bring the fire of God down on those people. We don't, you don't make a YouTube video against your spouse. You pray for your spouse. Well, if you would pray for your spouse, how much more should you pray for your enemies? 
those that hurt you, those that slander you. Matthew chapter 5, I believe, makes it very clear. We're to pray for those who persecute you. And unfortunately, most of the people that persecute us come from the religious community, come from our side of the fence. You know, I had somebody tell me once, Jim, I'm never going to believe what y'all believe. You know why? Because I watched how your brethren treated you when you were falsely accused. When you had your situation and your battle that you went through, your brethren weren't there for you, but to kick you in your face and in your ribs. Have you ever felt like you were kicked when you were down by those that you trust and you love the most? You know what? Christ had, he was crucified, not by the Romans, my friends, but by his own people. So we should look for it. It should not be normal. We should be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. We should not be filled with hatred and envy and always trying to one-up someone and jealous of their position or their, their influence or greed or fear of losing anything. I lost my entire ministry at one point because people were afraid of something happening walking out of a spirit of fear and then jealousy and, 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 and had a Cora type of, of feeling of way, hey, Absalom, I, I'm going to be in charge now. We're going to make things different. None of us are going to make anything different. Sin prevails no matter what. What we need to do is say, God, what do you want to do? What is life right now? What is the decision that I can make right now? My husband's being mean to me. What do I do? I'm going to tell you exactly what to do at the end of this video coming up here shortly. I'm going to show you three things that you can do that will radically change when you are upset and how to deal with that frustration. But the next time that you're tempted to judge someone, I want you to understand that you're taking a huge risk. There's no reward in judging someone. It's like, it's like, it's like saying that, that Jesus is going to come back and on September 15th of 2030, let's say, or whatever year that you want to say, there's no reward in all of the risk in the world because if September 30th, 2030 shows up and Jesus is still not here and the Messiah is still uh, in the clouds, but he's not coming down yet, you're going to lose all the credibility in the world. And if he does come back, you're not going to be going, see guys, I told you I was right. <laughs> There's zero reward, 100% risk. In the same way, when we judge someone on any level, if you miss one single thing, you get it wrong. You will be judged. And at the measure that you judge, you will be judged. So therefore, that's why it says, don't judge. If you're smart, you will simply take and plead the fifth. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it is true or not true, but I'm going to pray for that individual no matter what. It doesn't matter. If you stay out of the race, you cannot be judged. There's no risk. Matter of fact, you'd be following in line with the Messiah himself that chose not to say a word. If you're the one being slandered and accused, just be Christ. Let them crucify you. God told me once, let them steal. Everything that, they, that the enemy steals, I'm immediately taking it out of his hand, putting it on deposit, and returning it with great interest. So let them steal. Open up your wallet. Enemy, take it all. If God's going to give you back multi, multiple fold of what he take, let him steal. Don't defend yourself. It's not becoming. But remember, if you are a primary source of, of allegation, false or otherwise, the risk is not just breaking the ninth commandment of don't bear false witness against your neighbor, don't lie. You're in danger of breaking the first commandment as well, the second commandment, the sixth commandment, and even the tenth commandment. Here's why. The first commandment says, there's no other gods besides me. There's no other Elohim in Hebrew. And the word El Elohim means, as we learned, plural majestic magistrate. So if you bear false witness against your neighbor, you are playing God. 
You're being the judge. You're displacing the first commandment. You're ignoring it. You're saying, I am the judge. I have all the information. Let me tell you what. If you think you know all the information of why someone sinned or why someone's doing, I promise you, you don't have the context of their entire life. I met people in very dark places that, that were child molesters and I interviewed them and I asked them why they did what they did. And do you know every single one that I asked had been molested themselves? Now that's not justifying their sin, but there's context. Everyone has a story. Hurt people hurt people. And if you found out that that prostitute had been, had been kidnapped when she was seven years old, forced into a drug child trafficking, sex trafficking ring, and forced to do that, and this is the only thing that she knows, you might have less judgment and more compassion. But you can say all the facts are right. Look, I can see it right now. She's committing sin. She's helping men commit adultery. She's in fornication. She is. But we're not allowed to judge. We can say what what she's doing is wrong, but we're not allowed to judge her or condemn her. We pray because we don't know where everybody's at. Second, you break the second commandment. What's the second commandment? No other idols. You can't put anything else. No leaning on anything else. One God, but then don't lean on anything else. When we lean on our own understanding, oh boy, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 comes to mind, doesn't it? When we lean on our own understanding and we don't acknowledge him that he is the judge, he is the Elohim, then you make yourself not only Elohim, but you put yourself as the one you lean on. You lean on your own intellect, your own understanding, your own knowledge of the facts. When the government says this, when someone says this, when your spouse says this, it may not be. It may be half-baked facts and a whole other side of the story. If you've ever been falsely accused by a spouse, and you know what I'm talking about, right? I wasn't looking at that person. <laughs> there's more context. There's more information. Number six, thou shall not murder. We break the sixth commandment. When you bear false witness against your neighbor, you are destroying and murdering their reputation. There's no way to fix it because every person that you tell is going to tell someone else and someone else and the gossip chain goes and you can never, ever, ever get it back. So recently someone came to me, perfect example. Recently, a few months ago, a gentleman came to me and we had a discussion and he was upset because he had, of what had happened in my past and that he had heard and he had no information outside of what the internet said. So he made a false judgment. He made a judgment against me, believing that I was guilty of this, this, and this, and this. When he discovered the truth, he repented to me in tears because he said over the last seven years, he had told so many people, he, he promised he would go back and tell every one of those people what really happened. But there's no way to find all those people because it's spider webs into the hundreds and even the thousands. It's like taking a feather pillow. And taking the feather pillow, which has all of the information inside of it, taking it up to the highest building in your city and taking a knife on a very windy day and gutting the feather pillow and then watching the feathers go everywhere and then realizing what you've done and you try your best to go find, I promise God I will find every single one of those feathers. You can't. It's not possible to put the feathers back in the pillow. It's ruined. We murder when we judge. That's how serious this is. We break the eighth commandment. Thou shall not steal. When we bear false witness against one another, when we make criticisms and we are a spirit of a, a critical spirit and we're constantly making allegations and pointing out everyone else's faults, you know what that does? We're stealing from them. Because when you murder their reputation, when you point something out, when you've got logs in your own eye, you know what happens? You're stealing the truth. What is the truth? In Hebrew, we discovered it's emmet, it's aleph, it's leadership, it's the waters of chaos that produce covenant. You're stealing covenant from them. You're stealing relationships. You're stealing the truth from them. You're stealing their reputation. You're stealing some of, of their influence. If you are an influencer, and we all are, whether you are a parent or whether you're a teacher or whether you are a student or whether you are a pastor, 
When someone falsely accuses you, they're stealing that influence. And if you are influencing for the kingdom of God, then you're stealing from God. I hope you see this, my friends, breaking the ninth commandment and making false allegations and being critical of one another brings utter destruction. And if you are a primary source that comes from jealousy and envy and greed and fear of losing something, then you no doubt will have broken the 10th commandment, which is you should not covet. When we look at someone else and what they have, whether it's position or power or influence or, or money or whatever it might be that you want a talent, and you look at that a little bit too long, like Korah did with Moses or Absalom did with King David or the Pharisees with Yeshua, Jesus himself, you will always end up destroying that other person temporarily because God will restore them, but you will bring utter destruction to your own life. To judge someone else is to condemn your life, and in some cases, like Scripture says, your whole family gets judged. I don't know about you, but I don't want my kids to be condemned or judged because of my own sin. So when the sun sets on this topic, I'll pray that all of us will run from that critical spirit because that critical judgmental spirit, it comes straight from the pit of hell. Believers in Christ are supposed to be the most positive people on the planet. We're supposed to be uplifting and encouragement, letting nothing come out of our, our lips that are full of any kind of corruption at all. You never saw Yeshua going around and just, and just mouthing out criticisms for no reason. Now, if you are Yeshua and you can see into people's hearts, then you can speak to that Pharisee and you can call him a brood of vipers. But don't quote that verse if you don't know their story and the beginning and the end. We don't have that right. We are not Christ. We are told to love our enemies. We're told to pray for those who hurt us and persecute us and use us. We're told to lift up those that are weary and heaven laden. And we are told even to visit those that are in prison. We're not told to be critical of those that have made mistakes. We're told to be forgiving. Out of the whole Matthew 6, our Father, the largest part of it is, is that we are to forgive those who trespass against us. And it says that if we do not forgive, He won't forgive us. So let's give each other a chance. Let's open up the opportunity that maybe we're missing some information. And when all things in the dust settles, I want you to remember these three things. I promise I'm going to give you a formula that's going to change your life when it deals with conflict and your own frustration or you feel like someone has wronged you and you want to accuse them. Here's what you need to do. Number one, you say, you start off by saying, I could be wrong. Number two, but I feel that this is what happened. It made me feel this way. And you talk about your feelings. And then lastly, can you help me understand? I may be wrong. I could be wrong, but I feel this. Can you help me understand? When you do that, it immediately is going to put the other person not on the defense because you're admitting you could be wrong. You're asking for more information. You're telling them how this particular action looked or felt to you. So now you're dealing with feelings. And lastly, you're asking them, can you help me understand? You're giving them a chance to vet what you're feeling rather than coming to, you did this and you did that. And then you find out they didn't do everything that you thought. How many arguments have you been in with your spouse? And 90% of them, there was missing information. If we only did this for every single one of us that are in the body of Messiah, I believe people would be knocking on the doors of churches and asking us, hey, Tell me who this God is that you serve because I see nothing but light and love and fruit and I'm starving and sitting in the dark and lonely and rejected. My friends, let's not take the rejection from our past and bring it into the present. Let's not take the jealousy and put greed and envy into it. Let us be okay and excited about the station that God given us in life because eternity is a long time and God promises to bring you into glory. Whatever pain and suffering that you're going through right now, remember that He 
makes it all go away. And we are in an interview for that promotion. My friends, it is a blessing to be a part of your life. It's a blessing to be uh, ministering to you in such a way to get to go through just the simple 10 commandments. Next and final, we will go through the 10th commandment. We'll come back and we'll find the real meaning of all of them put together. In the meantime, would you do us a favor? Would you shoot us an email at info at passionfortruth.com? Would you consider supporting this ministry and moving forward with us and partnering with us to reach the nations? At the very least, please subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. It's the best compliment that you can give us and spread this word. In the meantime, I'm Jim Staley. I'll see you in the next video. If this video blessed you, I encourage you to watch this video and this video as well. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on those notifications. Check out our Instagram page at Jim Staley Official and visit our website at passionfortruth.com. In the meantime, I'm Jim Staley and I'll see you in the next video.